Welcome into the Name Undetermined College Football Show here on MNS. I'm Will, and today we're going to be breaking down week four of the college football season. I say breaking down. We're just going to have a light little discussion about it uh, because the truth is, much like we've had a, a few different weeks on this channel, there's going to be another video to talk about a specific game, a specific team, a specific fan base. So be looking for that probably later today, honestly. Um, so it was a weird week in college football because we had some big games, uh, but in hindsight, I don't – the only game I feel like that truly probably lived up to the billing uh, of the big game was USC and Michigan. So let's touch on USC and Michigan. Uh, Michigan, they can't throw the ball, but it didn't matter. Uh, for the first time this year, the offensive line imposed their will on another team, and that's not a terrible USC defense, but it's not – a strong enough one across the line of scrimmage to stand up to Michigan when they're firing on all cylinders, and they were. I believe Michigan had 32 passing yards. I think it was like 7 for 12 from Alex Orgy. Um, and, yeah, that's all they needed to do. They just ran the football, and they – I see, I would say they pounded USC into submission, but they didn't. Uh, they were a fourth and goal away from potentially losing that game at home like I predicted them to do, so I have to admit that I was wrong. but. I don't necessarily feel that way. I feel like I saw everything out of USC that I expected to see uh, to make me believe that they would win the game. And again, the difference was one fourth down conversion. So I don't feel too bad about that prediction. What I also don't feel too bad about is USC. I still really, really, really like what we have seen out of them so far this year. I feel like this result validates what we saw in the LSU game. Uh, that's a strong team. They're a much better team defensively. Now, sure, again, Michigan's not going to test you in the secondary, but let's be real. That's actually not really the area where you worry about USC as much, at least. It, it, like, yeah, they weren't strong all around last year, but if you can't win the line of scrimmage, you can't win a football game, and they were relatively close enough to maybe being able to win a game along the line of scrimmage. They didn't do it, but USC is a Big Ten title contender. I still would not predict them to be in that Big Ten title game necessarily, especially now that we're talking about a situation where maybe end up in a tiebreaker with Michigan and Oregon's now rolling on all cylinders. Ohio State is still the best team in the conference. Penn State uh, is a lot better than people realize because Bowling Green's a lot better than people realize. Texas A&M fans found that one out the hard way this week, but so it's going to be a tough conference for them to get into the championship game, but that's the whole point of going there. It's a high level of competition. So I like what I saw out of USC. Very proud of them. And good for Michigan. Good for Sharon Moore getting a big signature win early in his career, sort of quieting maybe some early doubters, even though early doubters at this stage would be a little bit crazy. But they happen, and they happen within the organization as well. So good to sort of put some of those things to bed. This is a really big win. I also want to talk about Miller Moss because later in the show, we're going to do the Heisman top four. And this is the first week where I think I'm going to make major shifts because now we have four weeks worth of games and we've had more people play in big games. And Miller Moss will be making an appearance in that Heisman top four. He's a really good quarterback, man. He is a prototypical Lincoln Riley kind of guy. And I don't know. He, he just... He, he makes all the throws you want him to make. He's smart with the ball. Uh, he doesn't seem to be all that rattled in big moments. So I would project him going forward to be deep in that Heisman conversation. So awesome for the USC fans uh, and just awesome for USC in general because USC being better uh, makes college football better. So that being said, quick sidetrack. Um, What's going on in Chapel Hill, man? Um, getting blown out at home by James Madison. Now, as an Auburn fan, I know all about getting blown out at home by lesser opponents. Uh, and I'm not talking about this past week's game. Uh, and you might say, well, Will, you didn't get blown out anyway. Well, I don't know. Uh, it wasn't the biggest 10-point blowout, I guess. But that's courtesy of Josh Pate. Uh, we'll talk about that game later. But... 
Um, going forward, what is UNC football? Because I don't want to sit here and like be one of the people that's like banging the drum, like, oh, you got to fire Mac Brown, this, that, and the third. I don't know that you're going to get much better of a head coach than Mac Brown, but this team has underperformed even like reasonable expectations the past three, four years. I feel like I want to say it's been since 20. So maybe I'm being ignorant there, but, uh, yeah, this is not a good team. Uh, and we're going to talk about a couple of teams on, on the show that are just not good teams, but UNC blown out at home by James Madison. Now, now I don't want to take anything away from those guys over at James Madison. They, they played a fantastic game. They hung 70 on a power five opponent in their house. Like, I, I don't care if it's a bad power five team. They still did it. That's wildly impressive. That's awesome for those guys. Uh, and especially the ones that maybe are fringe NFL draft guys that are going to have, that they're going to have more eyes on them going forward because of that UNC game. A lot of scouts are going to be looking specifically at that UNC film. So some guys might make it to the league that otherwise wouldn't have because of that game. So that's awesome. Uh, yeah. We're kind of seeing it now where uh, there are certain teams in the ACC that we thought would be contenders that just absolutely are not. Uh, UNC, I don't think anyone thought they were necessarily going to be contenders, but you thought they'd be a player. You know, you thought maybe they, uh, kind of the way I talked about how I thought Florida might be in the SEC where any given Saturday they could throw a wrench into things. I don't think UNC is that. In fact, I don't think any of the teams in the state of North Carolina are, man. NC State sucks. They're so bad. Whoa, um, I think that uh, I think that eight win streak. If you don't know, I, I don't know how many years it is. It's a comedic amount of time uh, under uh, Dave Doran, where they've had at least eight wins at NC State. And for NC State, that's impressive. That's not to say that that program can't accomplish more, but eight wins a year for a prolonged amount of time—that's a solid program. They're not going to hit it this year. I personally don't think, and I'm shocked as to why, uh, or I say I'm shocked as to why, I'm shocked in general. This is a team that I thought would have, honestly, some staying power late in the ACC. They just don't, man. Like, they're bad in seemingly all phases of the game of football. Maybe they turn it around. I really doubt it. Speaking of bad teams, Oklahoma State. Okay, they dropped to Utah. So, yeah, I feel really good about my sort of Utah going to the Big 12 championship game prediction now. Uh, now, I will say the, the Big 12 is still going to be a chaotic picture. And, you know, I still wouldn't bet money on anything. But Utah, uh, without having to do too much, yeah, they, they beat Oklahoma State, and that is because, and this is probably one of the more shocking things of the year, Oklahoma State can't run the ball. You know, the team with Ollie Gordon, the guy that was like the best running back in college football last year, projected to be a Heisman contender this year, be the best running back in college football this year, they can't run the ball. They are woeful uh, across the offensive line, and Ollie himself has not played that well. I think all of those guys would admit that to you, I would hope at least. Um, it's terrible. I, I uh, that's another program. Uh, not well. I, yeah, I will say it's similar to NC State, where they typically get a little more out of their guys than they should get. You know, Mike Gundy doesn't recruit really consistently in the top twenty-five or anything, but they've always been in the Big Twelve title race. I mean, it wasn't that crazy long ago. It's within the last couple of decades they were pushing to make it to the national championship game in the BCS era, but. I know there are some people that are saying that certain programs are getting passed by. I think that kind of thing is ridiculous because we're about to talk about another program that people said that about. That's just, it was never true and it's being proven to not be true, even though they lost. But just to finish up talking about Oklahoma, they backed into the win against Arkansas because Arkansas handed the game to them on a silver platter in the second half. Uh, and it might have overinflated expectations. Apparently, the AP thought they were a good team. I don't really know how that's all that possible, but yeah, I, I hate it for uh, Oklahoma State because that's a, I, I like pulling for my gun. Like he's a, he's a character. I'm a man. I'm forty. Like, you, you all get it. But there, I don't think they're going to be a contender in this thing. They should be. Uh, I believe they play Kansas State this week. 
and Kansas State also good. Uh, hell, and uh, here we go. Well, actually, I wasn't planning on even talking about Kansas State, so it's a good thing I said this. Getting rolled by BYU. Wow. Wow, Kansas State. Just not, unfortunately, also not very good. Uh, I They were one of the teams I talked about heavily in the prediction special as being a team that can go the distance. And I actually still think they can because I think their situation is a little more similar to Oklahoma, which we'll get to them, where they just haven't played their best football. When a team can't run block, uh, you're, you're probably not going to learn how to run block mid-year, right? But when you have people making poor decisions, and I'm, I know when I say people, everyone's going to say, oh, you're talking about the quarterback, Avery Johnson. Yes, but, I mean, it's not just him. It's everyone in the building. Like, people are just making mistakes. That kind of thing can be cleaned up. That kind of thing can be sharpened up. And I think that's still there for Kansas State. That, that there's a lot of talent on that team that I just would not give up on yet. But – they get rolled by a BYU team that is a lot better than people realize. That quarterback, Red Slop, he's good, man. Not like, I mean, he's nothing crazy, but he's good. Um, I wouldn't say good enough to warrant blowing out Kansas State, but apparently. Now, uh, I also, I mentioned it, or I mentioned them, so let's talk about it. Oklahoma. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah, they never had a shot to win the game. In the SEC opener, at home, against Tennessee, which, for all we know, Tennessee's the best team in the country. Maybe they are. But if we're going by, like, current perception of the conference, Tennessee is, like, maybe the third best team in the conference. You know, just talking about compared to, like, Alabama, Georgia, in a conversation with, like, your old misses and things like that. Um... So, obviously the big conversation in Norman, Oklahoma, is about Jackson R. Because he was supposed to be the equivalent to a franchise quarterback. Jackson Arnold was supposed to be the reason they were going to maybe hang in some games this year and push some teams. Uh, I felt like Jackson Arnold was going to be good. Like So, this is... Me admitting potentially being wrong here. Everyone's hitting the dump button on him. And I don't, I only somewhat understand. Jackson Arnold might be bad. He might not develop into being what he needs to be. He has started five games. He started five games. And to some people, say, yeah, started five games. But, like, what's the deal? <sighs> I know in this day and age, we expect these uh, guys that are getting paid a lot of money out of high school to play football, to come out and immediately play well. And we've seen a lot of guys do it. We saw the guy on the other side of the field shooting up the quarterback do it. Nico, similar situation. He started the same amount of games, I believe, as Jackson Arnold, and he was pretty good. He's he I mean he's in my Heisman conversation, may or may not be in the Heisman top four this week. But the infrastructure around him is a lot better than the infrastructure around Jackson Arnold. That offense is not good. They uh the bulk of the year first off, they haven't been able to run the ball very similar to Oklahoma State, where you're kind of sitting there going, like, okay, we're talking about Gavin Sawchuck as like being one of the better players in, in football, and you can't run the ball. They I think had like twenty four yards on the ground in the Tennessee game, averaged like one point something a carry between four running backs. That's abysmal. But when you watch the game and you understand, okay. Their top three receivers, I want to say, are banged up. I mean, Nick Anderson was in the game for maybe five. I, th I was listening to cover three. I think they said he was in there for five plays. Their offense isn't what it's supposed to be as a whole. And that responsibility does not fall solely on Jackson Arnold. Now, I will say, when Hawkins came into the game, it looked a little bit better. But by the point that Hawkins came into the game 
do we think Tennessee let off the gas? Not not like Rivers are saying like, oh, we'll let them have it. No, but I saw a lot of people saying this, and I believe it's true. Tennessee could have hung forty on it, man. Tennessee made what I believe is an incredibly wise decision in what was a very emotionally charged game to just only do what they had to do. And it won them the game. It was a very easy win for Tennessee. Now, shifting the focus to Tennessee, I feel really good about that team. I feel really, really, really good about that team. I feel great about James Pierce. For instance, that's a that's a good example because he did some things that I really, really liked in that Oklahoma game. Again, playing against a good offense, no. But good play is good play. Um, and sure, were they going to be tested in the secondary? Probably not. That We kind of thought that they would be. We thought that a guy like Nick Anderson would come back and free things up for a Dion Burks and things of the such, but it just it didn't happen. It just did not work. And we thought that Jackson Arnold would be able to push the ball downfield. Didn't happen. But you can only play who's in front of you. And Tennessee imposed their will on Oklahoma. I feel pretty good about that. Like we've seen a lot of teams so far this year either drop games or struggle with uh in games against teams they should dispose of. Tennessee hasn't fallen victim to that this year. They they dispatched of NC State and they did the same thing to Oklahoma. So We'll see about Tennessee going forward. I'm pretty high on them at the moment. Uh, And again, road environment just going in there. uh, Obviously, everyone has beaten the drum about Josh Heupel uh, in the lead up to this game. So I don't need to repeat the whole story of, you know, him getting playing the quarter, playing quarterback there, getting snubbed uh, to be the new head coach, this, that, and the third. Everyone knows that this is a special, this might be a special Tennessee team. So team to look out for. Uh, Missouri, uh, they survived against Vanderbilt. And I know a lot of people are going to look at that and go, oh no, do we need to punt on Missouri? Absolutely not. You don't. Vanderbilt is a team specifically designed to push teams to the wire that they shouldn't. <laughs> like that, that is not a bad team. Will they win a lot of games? Absolutely not. Uh, it's like, I, cause I know like people were talking about how, oh, Nick Saban said the only SEC environment that wasn't tough to play in is Vanderbilt. Like, yeah. Cool, but just as a football team, especially right now under Clark Lee, that's a good team. That's a good team that might just not win a lot of games because they're playing against a lot of really good to great teams type deal. So Missouri hangs on, doesn't play their best football. We got to talk about the quarterback there. I think people just kind of walked into the year and assumed like, oh, Brady Cook was okay last year, so he'll probably be at least the same, if not uh, better. Defenses catch up to people. And I would sit here and say that's what that is what is happening with Brady Cook, but I actually don't think that's the case. He's missing wide open receivers. He is not playing all that well. So I don't know what that Missouri quarterback depth chart looks like. I would not be shocked if there was someone maybe breathing down Brady's neck. And that might sound crazy for a team that's currently undefeated. But that's the key right there. Currently undefeated. They played in a lot of losable games. They got pushed by Boston College. They got pushed by Vanderbilt. And they probably don't if quarterback play is a couple ticks better. That's all I'll say about that. Or honestly, again, Brady Cook could just turn it around. He could find his rhythm. You know, like it doesn't have to be doom and gloom for him. So <laughs> good for Vandy to be able to survive that thing. Uh, I mentioned earlier Bowling Green took Texas A&M to the wire, and I know people are freaking out about that the same way they did uh, about the Penn State game. That is a like that's a solid team. That is a solid team in Bowling Green, and they play good football. And sure, absolutely. A&M and, and Penn State both should have the caliber of athlete to separate themselves from them. But this is college football any given Saturday. And Texas A&M escaped with the win. Speaking of escaping with the win, um, Florida pretty well dominated Mississippi State on the road. But obviously, I think the big thing here is Billy Napier escaped with the win. I would not be shocked if those Florida uh, – Front office people are breathing down his neck. In fact, I had the theory, and this is this is not guided. I obviously don't have any sources. I'm just some guy. But like my theory here is that 
Should he have dropped that game to Mississippi State? He might have gotten tarmacked, you know, like that. That I felt like that was a game he couldn't lose, and I think everyone on the team played like it. There seems to be significant buy-in on the team, at least uh, towards Billy Napier. Uh, both Graham Mertz and DJ Lagway played very sound football, and again, this is a good Mississippi State team. No, they suck pretty bad. They they might be the worst team in the SEC. Honestly, I think that actually. Yeah, I'll straight up say it. They'd lose to Vanderbilt. I actually I actually would take Vanderbilt over Mississippi State at this juncture. Now, ask me in a couple of years, Mississippi State, I I, uh, I like the hiring of Jeff Levy. It's just going to take time. That's really unfortunate circumstances that they've been punched into after the passing of Mike Leach. But, yeah, so Florida, Billy Napier, they escape. I know that's crazy to say for a blowout win, but that's kind of how I feel about that. I won't talk about Arkansas and Auburn. That'll be its own video. Uh, and I think all that we have left on the... Oh, Nebraska. So, uh, similar to Virginia Tech, where I was like, oh, I was really hoping Virginia Tech would be good and that they would be undefeated going into the uh, Clemson game late in the year. Nebraska, I think everyone kind of was sold on the idea that, oh, you know, if they, if they just... I think a lot of people maybe felt like, oh, you know, if they... If they just get past Colorado, like, I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I think people felt like there was a pretty good chance that Nebraska was going to be undefeated going into the Ohio State game in, I think, week nine. They will not be because they dropped a game to a really, 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 really good Illinois team. That is a very well-coached team. And there's a lot to like for Nebraska. Now, Rayola needs to tighten things up. He can't be taking the sacks that he does. He is a bit reckless, but what he's a first he's he's a true freshman. Uh he's got to learn from these mistakes and I still think even now that Nebraska is a playoff contender even after the loss. Now, I don't necessarily know that Illinois is a playoff contender. I think they might have just played some of their best football, but we'll see. Uh I want to see what Brett Bielema and the guys can do. So don't punt on Nebraska yet either. Uh, I know people are kind of clowning on Dylan Rayola because the whole Mahomes thing. But let's like just actually talk football here. Like a one-loss Nebraska going into Ohio State, that that's going to be a pretty charged environment, I think, because I think they probably will still only have one loss by that point. Now, to cap off the show, we are going to go into my Heisman Top 4, which... I actually do. I understand that I think the things I'm going to say are kind of controversial, especially if you've been keeping up with how I've done the list so far. Because we got some people on here that weren't here before. And there's a guy. There's a guy that I haven't talked about at all. And that is a shame on my part. I took a little bit longer to buy in. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you number one. Travis Hunter is my number one. Uh, that guy single-handedly shifted the Baylor game on both sides of the ball. And I want to also say, because the general public isn't going to admit it, Shadur Sanders is playing pretty fantastic football. He might, if you're being honest with yourself, at least by quality of play, potentially QB1 in the upcoming NFL draft. Um, Travis Hunter, he's an absolute freak. He has a deep understanding of both sides of the ball. He has freak athleticism to go along with it. He's the best player in the country right now. And he would get my Heisman vote. I, I talked about like, oh, like I have certain people, you know, in weeks past, like, oh, well, what have they done against who? Well, Travis Hunter has been almost the sole reason for Colorado being competitive and now having a win against Baylor, which to quickly touch on Baylor, yeah, the writing's on the wall probably for Dave Miranda, which sucks, but not the purpose of this conversation. So, Travis Hunter, welcome to the, uh, not just the Heisman Top 4, but the number one spot. So, effectively, my week four Heisman is Travis Hunter. And also, honorable mention, Shadir Sanders. He would be on this list as well. I think he's a fantastic player. Now, the two quarterbacks that are on the list are going to be consecutive. Uh, at number two... I would feel wrong dropping Quinn Ewers too much. I already said last week that I didn't want to drop him for getting hurt. But 
Travis Hunter, I felt like deserved to be number one. It wasn't that Quinn Ewers necessarily dropped us at Travis Hunter. I felt like elevated himself past Quinn Ewers. And you can make conversations of a lot of players doing that, but I just don't, I don't want to fall into the recency bias. So Quinn Ewers would still be projecting forward my uh, number two guy. Now number three, Miller Moss. I said that he would make his debut on the Heisman top four. Miller Moss has now played in two huge games and looked great in both. He, he might be the best quarterback in the Big Ten. I don't know if that I don't know if that's all that much of a hot take. I love Dylan Gabriel as a player. I think Drew Aller is show uh, proving a lot of people wrong. Miller Moss might be the best quarterback in that conference, though. And now uh, rounding out the list, Dylan Stewart is still going to stay here. I know people are going to be very upset about that because well, one Jalen Milro finally made the week last week and I've dropped him back off. Where's Nico Yamaleava? Where's Jackson Dart? Where's Cam Ward? Where's Shooter Sanders? I get it. I understand. I just, again, this is not me predicting what Heisman voters would do. I'm just saying when I see an absolute game wrecker, I see a game wrecker. Dylan Stewart is that, man. And yes, if you want to discuss that, oh, well, South Carolina's defensive line as a whole was really good, so maybe def- our offenses can't uh, solely key in on Dylan Stewart. That's fine. I understand that. I don't necessarily think that's true. I think uh, opposing offenses have had to scheme a lot around Dylan Stewart, but I'll concede that to you. My point is Dylan Stewart would be a top 15 draft pick if he went, uh, if he declared for the NFL draft today. He's a true freshman. I think he's going to get better as the year goes along. You know, uh, God willing, hopefully healthy, you know, um, with all of these guys, of course. But Dylan Seward is still my number four. We'll see what happens. I have a feeling that his production will probably drop just as attrition starts to set in and maybe opposing offenses will be able to more sufficiently key in on him. But for now, he's my number four. Of course, honorable mentions. I mentioned Jalen Moro, Nico Yamaleava, who was pretty good in the, the Oklahoma game. And Jalen Moro, of course, uh, didn't play this past week. Uh, we'll see. He'll have a big cone out party, hopefully, against Georgia. We're just talking about for his Heisman candidacy, uh, Jackson Dart. You know, I haven't seen anything that would make me think that he is a Heisman contender or not a Heisman contender. I need to see him play in a big game. And then Cam Ward, we did see him play in a big game at the beginning of the year against the potentially bad Florida team. But yeah, he, he's been electric uh, since that point. And I realize I just I haven't talked about him in this Heisman conversation. He's absolutely knocking on the door. He's just not in my top four. So that being said, that will do it for my quick recap of this week in college football. Thank you for watching. I tried to get y'all out of here in under half an hour. I know that last week's show was really short, or at least the uh, preview episode. So thank you for watching. Please leave a like and subscribe. See you next time.